Paul, I have some great news. Our next episode's going to be about Birdemic, Shock and Terror. And that was a bad movie, Birdemic, Shock and Terror. Yes. Man, this is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I hear a mountain lion. I gotta get back to the podcast, and you better get back to the podcast. It's human beings that need to stop being mountain lions. With the environment. That's it. I'm getting myself a podcast host that's environmentally friendly. Welcome to One Good Thing, Shock and Terror, the podcast that's looking for that one go-getting dream of a software engineer turned salesman who's going to give us all we want and a 50% discount. I'm Paul Tom Hill Salt. I'm Paul Plug-in Hybrid Goodman. <laughs> and today we have a very special guest uh, from the Video Negative podcast. It's Oliver Irwin. Hello there. Hi. Hello. Good to see you. Very nice to see you. Tell us all about Video Negative. Well, first of all, I don't have a, uh, a, a jokey middle name in joke I can insert into my name. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> the Video Negative podcast, that's a show I host with a friend of mine, previously another friend as well. It's, you know, one of those those oversaturated bad movie podcasts where we uh, really look at the cinematic dregs, from the specifically from the 1990s, for whatever reason. Mm. Uh, we thought it would be an angle, but... There's not much to it. <laughs> oh, you could try and make it a craft beer podcast as well. Yeah, we th- that would get some listeners. We have thought about that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a big market there. You know, <laughs> is it haven't you? Some beer accompaniments to, be to '90s drags. Mm-hmm. With this particular piece of shit, I would recommend. Yeah, swill, swill with this. <laughs> well, it's a really good podcast, and you know, you've had some really funny. You get some really funny commentary on these things, and you have a great format. So, I highly recommend all of our one good fingers. We did come up with OG team, but no, one good fingers for now for this one. Uh, I recommend for Birdemic. <laughs> for Birdemic, yeah. um, I recommend you check out Video Negative. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> for now. We're all going to dive headlong into the feathery explosion that is Birdemic Shock and Terror. Uh, James Gwen's 2010 romantic thriller. That's definitely what it is, guys. About a former software engineer who dreams of being a successful salesman and an aspiring model who definitely doesn't want to be a real estate agent who hook up amidst a bird-related environmental disaster. Boy, that didn't take long to say, did it? Imagine taking half a movie to say just that. <laughs> it's a film of two halves, this, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, it's very much like melancholia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this could similarly bring about the end of the world uh, if, if it fell into the wrong hands. <laughs> James Wenz? Um, well, I think it's well and truly there. <laughs> yeah. The film was unleashed upon unsuspecting critics who reacted with shock and alarm. Anton Battelle at Eye for Film said it's so dull, incompetent and ridiculous that it can and will be championed only by a repeat audience of ironists and iconoclasts looking for the next cult film to worship. <laughs> ironists. I'm not sure I've heard that before. Rakes. Charlatans. <laughs> Get some good old-fashioned words in there. <laughs> Some proper words, not like new words. New words are rubbish. <laughs> this rise of ironism will not stand, sir. Oh, won't it? That's one. <laughs> Strictly for cads, this film. <laughs> Bounders and cads. Um... We're in the right place, fellas. There were some joyful chirps, though. Uh, Ronnie Scheib at Variety said, Howlingly bad films are a dime a dozen. But the evident Ed Wood-like sincerity with which writer-director James Gwen lovingly crafted this compendium of cinematic don'ts gives it a goofy almost surrealist charm and that's a positive re- review isn't it <laughs> <laughs> technically no dangers in positive reviewing shit films yeah i'm gonna say straight off the bat like this film has no charm like, <laughs> i can see the i can see the appeal of like a film like the room or something or troll 2 
But like this mm. is like so earnest. There isn't any charm. <laughs> yeah, I struggled with this one. Ah, uh, well, I did read a lot of public reviews, but by far the most sarcastic was from uh, Amazon customer writing for Amazon, who said. <laughs> With all the recent controversies surrounding representation and diversity in film, it was truly groundbreaking for the director to cast a plank of wood in the lead role. <laughs> the, message of the message of the film is a subtle, well-crafted treatise on climate change and naturalism, much the same as a sledgehammer to the face as a fine critique of modern dentistry. As for the CGI, well, it easily matches even the best undergraduate film student. Maybe not from a good university, but I can imagine that effects this good would cost well in excess of eight pounds. <laughs> <laughs> He's an ironist. He is! <laughs> Bloody hell! Somebody call a policeman. <laughs> um, so guys, you hot Ferraris. Meh. Oh no! <laughs> What's one thing about Birdemic, shock and terror, that made you want to die of starvation due to the difficulty of finding enough food, such as seals? Seaweed as well. <laughs> oh yeah, some tasty okay, seaweed. Go. Well, I, I mean, I think it was those kids. You've got to when you're talking about apocalypse movies, you've really got to do it for the kids, haven't you? And there are some really good kids in this one. Some proper kids, oh, actual kids, not CGI yeah. terrible kids. Yeah, and much like real kids, I, I wanted to just hurt them always. <laughs> the thing that struck me the most, like this film's from 2010. Yes, but oh, it's, oh, it, it claims to be from 2010. But do we do we know the actual provenance of this? Because it looks like it's from about 1985. Mm. <sighs> was it like Dark Place? It's filmed in the 80s. It, yeah, it was like Samurai Cop. It was discovered in a vault in the basement of a <laughs> castle next to the sex dungeon. <laughs> yes, we do know a little about James Gwen, and I assure you that the very fucking second when the, the in fact, um, sorry, James when when <sighs> mm -hmm. or when. When you twat. The thing about James Gwen is, <laughs> I assure you, he got this to the fucking film festival ten minutes before it was finished. So don't worry, it was, it was very much of its time. All right. Well, what happens exactly in Birdemic? Shock and terror. Ollie, seeing as this is your, this is your recommendation. I'm sticking with this word recommendation. Um, you've got to own it. It's your responsibility. Why yeah. don't you start? Why don't Why don't I start? Okay. Uh, well, those uh, production company idents were quite something. <laughs> Severin. Um, <laughs> Severin. Um, what was the other one? Movie Head. Yes, that's his. That's his production company that he founded in the late okay. 90s. That sounds like a podcast. <laughs> movie head podcast. Two <laughs> guys sitting head. around talking about stuff, <laughs> drinking beer. <laughs> movie head podcast. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um. Well, it's dashboard cam, isn't it? For about three minutes. Yep. Or is it? Or is it a very full-sized movie camera awkwardly shoved into a car so they can't actually stand <laughs> up straight? Yeah. Sorry, it is that. Um. <laughs> yeah, it goes on forever, and they extensively <laughs> extensively list the credits, many of which are fake. Oh, really? Because, uh, yep, he um, put fake <laughs> people in the credits to make it look more professional. Well. Okay, uh, yeah, he Your also, face says it all. Er erroneously using the word starring as well, um, mm. and also introducing the supporting casts, it was pluralized. Excellent. Yep, multiple supporting casts. <laughs> We've got all casts. sorts of casts. <laughs> Four minutes into the film, we get our first scene, Yes. which is that he, our, our lead guy, Rod, <laughs> all-American Rod, yeah, it's a sturdy name. <laughs> You get f fish with that name. Um, <laughs> he goes into a cafe and has an improbable encounter with um, yeah. the waitress who has been taken over by some bizarre alien intelligence. <laughs> oh, God. Hey! Hey! There is a menu. Thank you. I'll be right back with you. You get thrown in at the deep end. This was the moment. After four minutes of opening credits, I was like, okay, I'm beginning to get the, the picture here. The, this guy doesn't know what the fuck <laughs> he's doing. But then that very first dialogue. Wow. <laughs> it's like, okay, mm. here's, here's our life for the next 90 minutes. <laughs> Rod then lays eyes on a beautiful, cherishing <laughs> presence <laughs> in the restaurant. And yes. she's, just, she's just trying to eat her eggs in, in peace, but... Uh, as soon as she realises that this guy, Rod, this genius Rod, is mm, eye-fucking her a little bit, she goes to leave, and he then takes that as an invitation to eye-fuck <laughs> her right the way out of the restaurant. Mm. <laughs> so, 
He follows her. It's okay, though. He's got some lines, <laughs> such as, um, hey, didn't we go to high school together? Uh, yeah, we did, actually. Great. Hey, are you from around here? Yeah, we <laughs> went to high school <laughs> together. Oh, man. Cool. Excellent. Also, you, imb- <laughs> you imbued that with far too much emotion. You're doing him a discredit. True. Um... <laughs> I'm discrediting Rod here, <laughs> who very much lives up to his name. He's worse than she is, I think. But I have this terrible thing where sometimes if an actress is pretty enough, I can't tell if they're acting um, well. Like, it's just a... a th- I'm, I might shock you, but I thought she was, I thought she was quite good. Maybe, okay. it's, just, maybe it's just in, in compared to everyone else, but... <laughs> Hello? Natalie? Who is this? It's Rod. Oh, the guy from the restaurant. What's up? Hey, it was nice running into it at Half Moon Bay. Yeah, it was nice meeting you. So, how's your day? My day's going well. How's yours? Great. I made a big sale today. Good. Fantastic. Thanks. Doesn't matter that Rod is a fucking inanimate walking nothing. He doesn't stop him from (laughs) scoring a big business deal of a million (laughs) dollars. Yeah. Fuck yeah. A million dollars? God, he says, not quite understanding what that means. <laughs> what did you have to do to get that? I just offered them a fifty percent discount. <laughs> we could have had two million dollars. <laughs> oh man, yeah. we're ruined. <laughs> what did you sell them? Two million dollars worth of computer monitors. <laughs> oh, you fucking geez. idiot! He said. I, I was reading that. Apparently, the director was a uh, a salesman. So he, yeah, this yes. Is... Well, this this shows why he ended up in Hollywood. This is how he funded his uh, this venture, Birdemic and Birdemic <laughs> Two. Selling two million dollars of things at fifty percent, <laughs> but um, yeah. So he 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 scores a big cool mill on this deal, and uh, he gets told that he has to go and have sex by his friend, which is great. And yeah. um, <laughs> the the lady, what's her name? It's I not Whitney. That's the actual. It is. Actor. Oh yeah, that's her actual name. Not Natalie. Natalie. Good okay. knowledge. Good birdemic knowledge. <laughs> I'll steer you true. She s- scores her own big deal. She's got uh, a modelling gig with Victoria's Secret. Mm. Yeah, she's going to be the Victoria's Secret cover girl. That's how it gets <laughs> said. She's going to be Victoria's Secret. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to be the cover girl because they only ever have ever have one at a time. It's like the Milky Bar kid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The secret oh, is God. she's not getting paid for that job. <laughs> <laughs> That's a shame because she's such a good actor. She informs him of the Victoria's Secret deal. Rod says... I think you look great in those lingerie. That's right. Just <laughs> creepy. And then he says, I know a great Vietnamese place. Yep. And Natalie replies, sounds delicious. I'll see you then. No time, no location. <laughs> just oh, the good one. Vietnamese you want to meet the good Vietnamese place? I'll see you there. Well, that's only o- it's only open between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. on a Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so you just got to go and do it. It's James Wen's Vietnamese place. The rest of the time it turns back into a living room. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, I was also struck by the amount of uh, dead air in between each line of dialogue that sort of makes the <laughs> makes it seem like the film's buffering. I think that's either romantic tension <laughs> or foreboding. <laughs> mm, that's that's charitable. <laughs> so they they have well, I mean, they have quite a chat in the Vietnamese restaurant. Mm. Yeah, I remember that she says um, there is, of course, a great big a great love in my life. Uh, I have a picture of him right here. And um, he's like, who the fuck is it? Tell me who they are. I will fuck. I'm, yeah. I'm going to storm out of here right now. <laughs> is he bigger than me? You fucking bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a cat. Aww. Oh, I love cats. I take Aww. that back. Isn't he cute? Why are you crying? She's, she <laughs> says she wishes she had money to buy 10 cats. <laughs> yeah. And he doesn't run out of the restaurant screaming. So um, oh. <laughs> it's the most plausible moment of the film. This is also the scene where we, we learn that Rod used to be a software engineer and now he's mm-hmm. a software salesman yeah, it's riveting. and they're a hardware salesman and that she's a Victoria's Secrets model but her mum wants her to be yeah. an estate agent yes this is the first scene where we learn that it sounded like a job interview this date <laughs> so where, where do you see yourself in five years <laughs> yeah when Rod was talking about his, his, his well essentially his employment history it was this sort of <laughs> delivered with the you know the rigidity of a you know a pre-prepared job interview answer like <laughs> you know you know you work, work well in a team but just as well on my own you know it did sound like that it also sounded like a language tape for beginners <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. And then is this where they go outside and see some CGI parrots flapping about? Mm-hmm. Excellent. Some of their courtship's going to be a little tricky here because, okay, there's that. And then, I, then I've then i got my next note. The next thing of note that I wrote down is 
that they were su- they were against a green screen with a club in the background because yep, they couldn't they go film in an actual club. So yeah, just, it's it, just... it's a ten second or five second shot, but you're right, and it <laughs> it was terrible. Like, and nothing gets said in it. You could have easily not had it. Yeah, and then later on they do dance at a real club with that guy <laughs> yeah, singing that with a real singer, song. a real Irish bar. Yeah, I love that song. That was the best <laughs> bit of the fucking film. <laughs> it's real. It's actually, somebody doing some doing something with some emotion, with some conviction. It reminded me of nice. 90s rap. Just hanging out with his family. Oh, I think at that point I was really starting to drift off like... Uh... <laughs> Just checking Instagram. Then we go back to a good old business deal, don't we? Is back this with where... Rod's working life. Yes. Because his deal. boss has got some good news. <laughs> There's a, <laughs> bit a big business deal. He's got some news that's going to break all of your concept, concept of time. <laughs> this news is so good, the next t- 60 seconds of time is going to play out like a fucking nightmare for each of you. You're not going to know what's going on, but just hold on. I swear to God, time will reset back to normal after you finish celebrating. You guys have worked hard and you've all earned your stock option. Congratulations. When 12 people applaud at the same time, it does. It, it's like Primer, basically. That's actually how they, where the film came from, Primer. <laughs> They've sold their cool software selling business for a billion dollars. <laughs> exactly one. <laughs> billion ones. <laughs> a billion cool ones. All of your shares are going to be paid off. Um, you, 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 you. They got a 50% discount. Yep. <laughs> a billion dollars is still pretty good. Two billion. But, mm. You know, unfortunately, we let fucking Rod handle the dealings. <laughs> the next scene is... Um, Natalie goes home to her mum in order to tell her some things we already know. That she has a boyfriend, that she doesn't want to be a real estate agent, that she's her modelling is going well. That the bo- I think mm-hmm. she even fucking says that the boyfriend used to sell software or something. I swear to God that she just summarises the movie so far. <laughs> you could have started the film here. <laughs> yeah. it's, an, it's an edgy demanding plot. You've got to... You can't overestimate the audience. Okay. Yeah. Also, I want to I want to bring attention to the the news broadcasts. Oh yes, sorry, we've skipped these. Yeah, yeah. The, one that, the one that stuck in my mind was the one about Formula One. Do you remember this one? Solar powered f- green Formula One racing. Yeah, and the reason I noticed is because the f- the footage that they used in the in the broadcast. Was uh, was from Getty Images. You can still see the watermark on the footage. <laughs> Excellent. Like... Jean Paul Getty Senior himself would be very proud. <laughs> <laughs> Just go on YouTube and find some <laughs> something without a watermark. Jeez. Oh, um, this is a very yeah, cheap the, news station with terrible eye lines as well. Like there's a lot of dead space above that broadcaster's head and in. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And. <laughs> And in my head and my soul. Mm. So anyway, they say, um, let's go to the beach. And then they go to the beach and there's a dead bird, apparently. No, there isn't. Adjacent to the beach. <laughs> it's clip art. That is what it is. <laughs> yes. Clip art dead bird. A bird has been drag and dropped the edgy onto the beach. expansion pack you can get for clip art. Yeah, heroin needles, used condoms, <laughs> dead birds. Yeah. I can recreate Glasgow Beach. <laughs> By the way, when they were on the beach um, and they were sort of mm. talking about again, it kind of is another job interview thing. Where do you see yourself in five years? And because Natalie yeah. um, is talking about uh, future plans, and she says, "If I don't mm. figure it out by the time I'm thir," and then there's just a she's there's just a big dirty cut before she says thirty. <laughs> That's fine. People get the idea. And then they just put like the second take in after it or something. It's so bad. Oh, that was man. James Huen finally just saying like, you know what? We've said all this. They couldn't be bothered <laughs> to go back and cut the whole thing. So it's just like, wait. There was like a mo- that was the moment of realization on behalf of him. I was like, fuck, we better cut to the birds. 
<laughs> We've only had two scenes of birds in, and we're about 20 hours into this now. <laughs> oh, no, wait, hang on, hang on. We've just got to include another bit of Rod talking about his various business deals. He does explain one more time that last week his company was sold for a billion dollars. He made a million dollars. And this week, his startup was funded for $10 million. In, in the next five minutes, all that happens is... They go on some dates. Yes, here's Watch the friends. dates. They go on a double date with Sex Obsessed Friend and they go to see a great movie, An Inconvenient Truth. Yeah, oh my God. It is worth pointing out at this stage that the double date they go on is with Rod's friend and Natalie's friend who just happened to be dating. That's right, yeah. they're coincidentally. And they react to that like, huh, if I started dating a girl and it turned out that she was not only friends but best friends with Nell, when I told you about it, it wouldn't be a case of, huh, it would be, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> no! <laughs> oh my god! Jesus, no! There is a god, our lives are intertwined! And he hates us. And, but you would then you would then allay those anxieties by going watching An Inconvenient Truth together. <laughs> Date night! <laughs> I thought this was just a, just a, a apropos of nothing reference to the fact they'd been to see An Inconvenient Truth. I didn't think that was then going to be a major theme in fucking Birdemic. <laughs> is environmentalism and the plight of forests and deforestation. Like. But all that foreshadowing. They, they they finally do it together. Yes. Like real adults. After and, a little um, bit more concentrated eye-fucking. He seals the only deal that really matters. And then once he's done that, he puts his, tr- he puts his trousers back on and goes to sleep on top of the bed. <laughs> <laughs> he did give her a 50% discount, though, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, what aspect, though? <laughs> Oh, half the shaft. Sexiness c- comes. <laughs> oh, God. I 50, knew you were going to make it worse somehow. 50% deposit. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> In response to his terrible sex deeds, all the birds attack. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah. Before the attack, and the, the, the next scene after the sex scene is the, the, the sort of shots of the town, eerily quiet, almost too quiet. Yeah. Almost as if someone just muted the audio track. <laughs> because it's pure silence. Mm. And then, I wonder who. <laughs> and James Gwen just sort of hides behind his desk. Ooh. Jeez, this will work. Cheeky. I mean, in any other film, that would have been... That could have been hailed as a, a deeply, intensely cinematic mm. moment. <laughs> in this film? That's because it then cuts to an abrupt scene yeah. of birds attacking the fucking town. And, and, and the sound that accompanies that doesn't let up for the the remainder of the film. Yeah. <laughs> Here they come! <laughs> You're completely right. That horrible screeching fucking sound is just there now you just got to get used to it it's like a light switch it's on we are 47 minutes into a 90 minute film mm-hmm. and the birds are attacking it's ugh. i mean james when said that this isn't a disaster movie paul so i mean uh. what are you expecting <laughs> the thing is i know we'll get to this but it's about this time that the birds go crazy and the birds hmm. like it's about now that the playground scene happens but birds have been freaking out and going crazy and scaring people throughout the entire movie so far. Tippy Hedron gets hit by a bird in the first yeah. ten minutes. To be fair, Paul, there was that <laughs> there was that dead clip art on the beach. Mm. <laughs> oh yeah. So And the parrots. Yeah. Fortunately. And the parrots. And they saw an inconvenient truth. What more do you want? <laughs> <laughs> but we were well in at the second act by that point, like there's a Ferrari in the first arc, so, you know, but Chekhov's Ferrari they didn't it didn't pop back up again in the third arc. <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, they don't even use it to oh escape. My God. That was James Wen writing checks that his ass can't catch, isn't it? <laughs> oh, shit, I said he's got a Ferrari. Oh, fuck, I've got to use it now. <laughs> oh, fuck. They could have used a clip art Ferrari, I'm sure. <laughs> really that. <laughs> Just, that would be <laughs> fucking great. <laughs> horrible fake Ferrari pasted onto the screen. <laughs> I, it would be incredible. You know, I likened these, because I don't think we've given these birds the bird no. effects enough. Um, no. Let's get into Gravitas. this. Yeah, I mean, they are just sort of gifs. Yes. They're essentially gifs of birds. They're just sort of nebulously pasted onto the screen with, like, yes. no consideration mm. for perspective or, well, realism. 
for a start. <laughs> um, yeah. This might be a reference for nobody, but they look like those like early 90s point and click horror games. Did you ever <laughs> see those? Like Harvester and Phantasmagoria? <laughs> yeah. Yes. I was going to say Mist from like the early noughties. <laughs> Interestingly, I'm thinking of like um, those Space Invader alikes, and there was one called Bats. It was just bats slowly <laughs> descending from the top, and you had to just shoot them. B A T Z. It was the 90s. It was a hell of a time. Either way, they're from a computer game from yeah. 20 years earlier. I think is the main <laughs> message here. Yes, that's the takeaway here. They they really are a, astounding garbage. They hook up with um... <laughs> some fucking randos. Yeah, two randos, one of whom seems to be an army guy who's just got really yeah, tired yeah. of the killing over in Iraq, man. Yeah. And um, his yeah. girlfriend, who's dreadful. Yeah. What, hap- what, what happened to Rod and Natalie's friends? I don't know. Anyway. Um, they get coat hangers. And they go out to ineffectively wave at the fucking villains. Just feet, just inches away from where fucking army guy yeah. has his machine gun. <laughs> that he can use to kill at least three birds. I do want to say that that coat hanger scene is... That's the moment that I realised that I was in the big leagues. It's, nothing is achieved on either side. It's just stalemate. It's delicious. God. They get in the car, they drive on, and I think the first thing that happens to them is they encounter a car accident, uh, underneath which are two... Well, in and amongst which there are two kids, a boy and a girl, mm-hmm. whom they rescue. Yeah, one, one of the kids was in the, the boot of a car. <laughs> yep. So was he He was in there before the pandemic attack. Yeah, <laughs> That was Gary Sinise's car. <laughs> you don't have to get the film reference. Uh, that was just Gary Sinise's car. <laughs> There's no, no reference there. Um, it's just one of his pastimes. <laughs> so they drive around a bit. They go into various shops and they pick up water pretty much in every location they are. And by the, by the, the time they're done visiting shops, they have about 50 litres of water in, like for the next day. There's some scene. There's some scene in there where it's something like... Um, a bunch, they're near a bunch of dead birds... And they say something like, what killed all these birds? Oh, a man killed all of these birds. Why are the birds attacking? Well, these birds are dead. <laughs> no, not... <laughs> what? <laughs> and my brain broke. Like, two cogs just hit each other and didn't turn. And I just thought, Jesus, this is the most stupid thing I've ever seen in my life. And I adjusted accordingly to the tracking of this film's stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> you have to Chain. recalibrate. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that exchange as well. And... <laughs> It was baffling. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just, it was so frustrating to watch two characters just not communicate with each other at all. Mm. They're bumping together like balloons. <laughs> boom, boom. Hello, OG team. Unfortunately, at this stage, a audio fault meant that we lost some precious pieces of exposition here. What you need to know is that Army Guy's girlfriend was killed by a bird swooping in and killing her while she was taking a shit. You're all caught up now. Let's check back in with those crazy guys to see what they have to say about this highly unusual character death. Her name is Becky. That's right. <laughs> no! Oh, Becky! Yeah. No! She died. What a way to go. The way she lived. <laughs> <laughs> you live by the turd, you die by the turd. <laughs> There's about five minutes of hilarious running after that, um, back and forth on the same path. And then it's that. They come across this bus. Uh, I think the random military guy says, uh, let's see those people on the, on the bus. And Rod says, we can't, there's no room. And then military dude says, they killed Becky. What if it was Natalie? It's like, <laughs> that has nothing to do with saving these people. On the- You're right. <laughs> what the fuck? Like, do it I mean, Becky. it was perplexing, but also I've got to give... The director credit for, you know, employing William Burroughs' uh, cut-up <laughs> technique. Because I think that's what he did when he wrote this script. He uh, <laughs> he had something cogent, and then he just went to work with the scissors <laughs> and pasted random shit together. That's my own, That has to be the only explanation. Either that, or he was late for the first day of filming and dropped all the pages and hadn't numbered them, and it was like, fuck! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is where the birds vomit orange juice yeah. on them. Thereby killing them, they... because they were all... They all had a vitamin C under deficiency. <laughs> Too much. Too much. Their immune systems just couldn't hack being that good. Did you notice the uh, industrious shopkeeper still operating despite this this yeah. bird birdemic? Hey, he's got to make and, a dime. Uh, and this is James Wen taking a leaf out of Werner Herzog's book, just casting the newsagent's owner in the role of newsagent owner. <laughs> and, uh, well, you yeah. can tell, can't you? 
Well, at this stage, they end up in the forest where they meet Tom Hill. Yeah, well, because they've run out of gas and water. Yeah. So... Just <laughs> to the forest. Wonder why? Yeah, yeah. They go. To, they're going to collect water from the stream, and they run into Woody Harrelson. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I saw you. I saw your tweet, and it was a remarkable likeness. <laughs> Best thing I've ever noticed. <laughs> you live in a tree? Sure do. So you're a tree hugger? Ah, uh, you could put it that way. I love trees. They're my family. I look out for them and protect these precious redwoods. So can we play in your trails? Sure. Yes, that'll be fun. No way, it's too dangerous. The eagles might come there. Oh, they won't. You're very safe here in the forest. He tells them about something and then a mountain lion comes, apparently. According to a sound effect. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he bangs on about big businesses yeah. destroying yeah. the forests. They all listen because it's not like there's a bird-related apocalypse going on at the time let's hear what let's hear this old fucker out yeah <laughs> shh, shush everyone listen to what woody harrelson has to say <laughs> suddenly the birds are able to like set fire to the forest yeah does that happen i do not remember yes, that at like, all <laughs> well the fire is terrible but yeah. i remember it yes. very distinctly because yes. there's okay. a scene of the forest with little fires going off and just before the scene transitions the fires disappear leaving just the forest then it transitions to the next scene Oh, it's beautiful juicy he couldn't get the fires to fade out with the scene <laughs> they find their double date friends double dead oh yeah they? Yep. They, they, they happen <laughs> up upon them their throats have been slashed no uh, the, the they say you'll oh, have well. your hot ferrari in the next life <laughs> yeah. I didn't get to tell him I had sex <laughs> I know you're crushing it beyond my good friend <laughs> is, it, is this the, the, then they go to the beach yes they're at the beach they've run out of food but Rod finds a fishing rod hey if I fish with this, I'll be the fishing rod. Uh, <laughs> just go and fish. Come on, guys. Rod. We've all had a lot of fun during this bird apocalypse. I hate you, says the kids. I, li- I literally hate you. <laughs> oh, good one, I. I want a happy meal. Fuck off. Thank you. Yeah, so he, so he fishes and Natalie collects seaweed just fresh from the fucking ocean, which is how you eat seaweed. And sure it is. the kids... <laughs> The kids, uh, they want a happy meal. It's very <laughs> good family moment. Raw seaweed gets uh, costs you 45 quid in Hoxton these days. <laughs> <laughs> Extra salty, it's good for you. And then the birds just go away. Yeah, the birds leave. <laughs> yeah, that's the end of the film. No, no explanation given. I think Natalie does ask, why Why did the birds leave? But Rod, Rod doesn't deign <laughs> to he says, answer that. Doesn't <laughs> dignify it with a response. <laughs> he puts his finger in front of her lips, just no, no, no. <laughs> The important thing is, we need to talk about you becoming a real estate agent. <laughs> oh, God, that was it. Fuck me. <laughs> that was birdemic. Well, wow. mm. How'd you get on, guys? <laughs> How'd it sit with you? It was mixed. <laughs> Ups and downs. Yeah. It was a, a roller coaster of emotions. <laughs> yeah, I spent a fair amount of time laughing. Hysterically? Yes, definitely. Uh, in the times when I was laughing, I was laughing a lot. But mm. the thing is, because, like most So Bad They're Good movies, because they're not trying to be funny, there are long periods of dull semi-competence. <laughs> yeah, there's always an issue. <laughs> the moments where he aspired to being okay were the dull ones. Yeah, I guess it's okay. I mean, the dull moments for me were the pumpkin fair. Um, yes. <laughs> driving around. Driving around. It was mostly the pumpkin fair. And I guess, you know, it worked for <laughs> Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. It's, for its pumpkin why fair. Why didn't it for this? And why didn't it work for Birdemic to, for the action to come in around the same time as the birds? And I, and I think it's, and I may be going out on a limb here, is that everyone in this was a complete void. No, the thing is, it feels unfair to single out the acting. Because I'm not, just, I'm not blaming the actors. There's almost yeah, nothing I'm, in this film that actually successfully works. It, it, yeah. It, it's systemic. It's very unusual, but uh, of course a lot of that is because James Wen did take on a lot of the responsibilities himself. You know, in spite of what the credits might say, he is editing this, he's doing the cinematography, <laughs> Yeah. he's oof, doing the special effects, it seems. <laughs> he did, and according to the actors, like, the thing is, he himself speaks with a sort of half-broken English. It's not that bad, you know, he's been in the country since he was nine. But mm. he does have this sort of uh, very noticeable accent. And according to the actors, they tried to correct the dialogue at various points, put some, you know, possessives in there and, you know, let words mm. like a or the 
rather than just let's go Vietnamese yeah. restaurant. You know, it's <laughs> but he would he would frequently insist that they read it as it was written. At what point and how incessant would that have to be before you just give up and go, all right, fine? Because <laughs> there must have been some pushback. Yeah. You know, they, it took it took a while, but George Lucas eventually <laughs> relented and went, okay, well, you can you can shape my shitty dialogue. It's a weird thing that happens with these so bad it's good movies that are, are made by mm. people whose first language isn't English. Like Troll Two, same yes. thing. The guy was like, stick to my dialogue, and it was all written in. Terrible, broken English. That's right, he was Italian. Samurai Cop as well, I think. Yep, Amir Shirvan. And it does make you wonder to what extent the director sort of impacted on that. Mm. And it's, yeah. you, know, I, I'm, I, you know, I have to imagine the same is true the, the other way. If an English director went and tried to make a movie in a language he didn't fucking speak or only half spoke, the results would be spectacularly bad. Mm-hmm. It's, it's awkward. Um, at this stage, should we get a little bit into James Wen <laughs> and just talk about him a bit? Sure. Because sure. He, it is... Why not? It is a phenomenon. Birdemic Shock and Terror that became a hit. And Birdemic Shock and Terror is a romantic thriller. There is ro- the first half of the film is romance between the lead protagonist. Uh, but there's foreshadowing, foreboding, that perhaps all is not well. And halfway through the movie, the movie unfolds itself, reveals itself, and you understand why the eagles invoke your attack. Uh, so it's a romantic thriller, you know, Mr. Alfred Hitchcock, he invented the genre of romantic thrillers. So as mentioned, he's a Vietnamese immigrant who came to the U.S. after the fall of Saigon. He was nine years old. Um, He became a software engineer in Silicon Valley, but his passion was movies. Very, very specifically the movies of Alfred Hitchcock, uh, whom he claims invented what he refers to as the romantic thriller. Uh, He directed a few movies, both of which were romantic thrillers, but then decided to go all in and invest $10,000 of his own money into his take on the birds that was also heavily influenced by an inconvenient truth. He made the movie, which seems to have been an unpleasant shoot. He was mean to the cast, and he occasionally yelled at random passerbyers for wandering into his frame. Incidentally, he shot the whole thing without permits. No, I'm not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you get the impression that the minute cut was yelled, everyone had to run away very quickly. <laughs> Less people in the background. It sounds like sirens approaching. We better go. <laughs> Just hanging out with my family. Well, hey, who are you guys? <laughs> Shit, run. I thought I was singing in this empty club as usual. Do you reckon they filmed all the parent scenes in in just some fucking stranger's house as well? <laughs> they're like, you should really think about becoming an estate. Oh shit, they're back! <laughs> <laughs> just like her fat her fat mum trying to get out the kitchen window. <laughs> oh god! The movie does get made, and he takes it to Sundance, and Sundance don't want it, so he ends up driving around the town in Sundance with a car covered in blood and feathers, with bird screams on the radio, oh. with his website spelled wrong on the side of the car, <laughs> trying to sell the movie to one person at a time. He left the R out, oh. so it just said Bidemic. Bidemic. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh it's the American dream, God. really, isn't it? It really is. You know, and he, I've heard him try to sell the movie on numerous occasions, and he always does it the <clears> same way. He always says this about it. It's a birdemic shock and terror. Why do the eagle and vulture attack? Who lives and who dies? It's a romantic thriller. Birdemic's about a platoon of eagles and vulture attacking a small town. You know, why did they attack? And uh, will the protagonist live or die? It's a thriller, you know? Like, that's that's the pitch every time. <laughs> that sounds familiar. Is that a line in Birdemic? <laughs> <laughs> why do they attack, though? So that's what he thinks the draw is. Better films than this have done completely ambiguous endings with, you know, providing very little explanation. Why, why doesn't it work for this? <laughs> why is it just annoying? Because it's obvious why they attacked or why James Wen has made them attack. It's because of the fucking global warming and they fly off, according to Wikipedia, I think, because they decided to give man an extra chance. Oh, wow. This was a warning. Fucking okay. Wow. Well, I, yeah. Didn't get that <sighs> <No>. <laughs> from the subtext. <laughs> Well, that's you need to you need to watch it three or four times like I fucking ended up doing. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> you're a braver man than I. <laughs> I think I'm desensitized. <sighs> one of the people he sold it to was Evan Hus- Husney, mm. and another one was Bobby Hacker, and they both initially thought that this was a protest of some kind. But then they attended the screening that Gwen had um, that Gwen had organized in a um, a bar uh, near the festival, and they loved it. And they had a little bit of pull in distribution. They worked in film acquisition. So they ended up hooking him up with Severin Films, who agreed to distribute it. At this stage, he thinks he made it. Like, he's made it. It's it's done. You know, congratulations, we're going to make it after all. Mm. Hollywood. And there is an explosion. 
Because suddenly everyone wants to watch this movie. And the BBC and NBC want to interview James. Mm. Because it is hilariously bad and people want to laugh at it and find out more about how such a bad movie got made. The mm. problem is, Wen doesn't seem to be aware of any of this. I can say that, uh, that you know, the majority really liked, uh, liked the movie. Really, uh, genuinely liked the movie uh, for its sincerity and uh, a compelling story. And they want to ignore the, its all imperfection. Do you think it's a good film? I think that it's a good film uh, based uh, with the condition that well, what I had to work with. I think that from a distance, I think those eagles and vulture look pretty realistic uh, and shocking and terrifying. It's just like a hundred million dollar picture, Hollywood style. He admits that the effects are cheap due to the budget, but he claims that the performances are good, it has a great storyline, it makes you think, and that it looks like a Hollywood movie. <sighs> and he says that although some people in the audience might be laughing at it, most are laughing with it and enjoy it because of the sincerity. Mm. Laughing with and... the obvious comedic moments in a romantic thriller. <laughs> 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 laughing at the bird attack. I will say that it's very, this film is very earnest. Yeah. There's yeah. no knowing sort of references to its cheapness or anything like that, which <laughs> nope. I gather that there is in the sequel. Apparently, the yes. The sequel's a lot more... Yeah, yeah. But it's, al it's almost childlike, the script. Yes. It's like something I w me and my friends would write <laughs> when we were kids. Definitely. When you were idiots. <laughs> yeah. Before I became an ironist. <laughs> Before I got my ironist card. Yeah, everyone genuinely gestures like a Skyrim NPC. Oh my they? god. Oh, <laughs> There's no <laughs> more look, Skyrim's a great game, but it's NPCs. <laughs> I'm gonna need you this. to develop at least two more frames of reference for people acting awkwardly. <laughs> no, I don't need to. <laughs> he made Birdemic 2, The Resurrection, um, which everyone does complain is too self aware. Except that that's on behalf of everyone except Gwen, because yeah. everybody wants to be in Birdemic 2, even the main actors who return are like, okay, let's lean into the terribleness this time. The only person who genuinely thought it was a serious movie was the director, writer, slash editor, etc. Now he wants to make Birdemic 3, Sea Eagle. <laughs> Worst name for anything ever. He wants to make it as a 10 to 20 million dollar movie. And he stubbornly refuses to consider making anything else that might make mm. him develop as a serious director, which is apparently what he wants to fucking be. He is the Birdemic guy now, and so far he hasn't been able to recreate that magic a second time. That magic. <laughs> so, I, I don't know how to feel about Gwen and his story. Is it the American dream? Did he start with nothing, risk it all, and make it? Or is everyone just kind of making fun of a very sincere man? It's part of the American dream. It's one stage of the American dream. The the, the part where you start with nothing and you and you work really hard. That that bit is there. <laughs> the, the the success part is the I guess is, is yet to come. Watching those those interviews where he's acting like he's made it, he's got like that small wad of cash in his hand once he oh. sold his film to Severin and who I can only feel were yeah. kind of taking the piss when they bought the film anyway. I mean, they definitely wanted to sell it as a comedy. Distributing a, like a mental cult film. So bad it's good film. Yeah, um, that's definitely the case. And nobody expected it to be as popular as it was. But then going, yeah, then going through this interview, I'm just, I just careen between opinions of the guy. Is, is he deluding himself? Is yeah. he bullshitting? Or is, is he just stupid? I, don't, I really don't know. I, <laughs> I, I think it might be a mix of everything. He's, he's definitely egotistical. He definitely believes that he, yeah. you know, he's better than what he's currently worth. It really feels to me like his. He thinks the only problem with the movie we all just watched is that it it did it was too low budget. Mm. Now, movies that were made for less money than this include El Mariachi, uh, Robert Rodriguez's first <laughs> film, and uh, one of my favorite films of all time, Primer, cost seven thousand dollars to this movie's ten. Wow. You know, and there's also Colin, the sort of British zombie film that was meant to have cost like fifty pounds or so. <laughs> so that's really it's really not an excuse. The problem is that you've got everything there's no talent mm. at all to yeah. any of this. I think no. you have to be an egotist to pursue something mm. so terrible in such a, a dogged way, such a relentless way. You have to be an egotist. Mm. Like well, I mean, to create in any way, really, you have to ha be a bit of an egotist. You have to have some confidence that you're good enough to to do it, or like conviction <laughs> that what you're doing is worth, yeah, worth your time. You know, it just some people aren't 
as good <laughs> as, as Lars von Trier, I feel like for that's example. That's an interesting side of the underdog story is what happens to the truly mediocre you know and and you sometimes see this picked up in um, mm. popular culture like um, Amadeus was kind of about this you know what is the fate of the person who's just not a genius and no matter how hard he tries he just isn't one and um there's a Milos fucking Foreman reference in this Birdemic episode now <laughs> I'm not doing this I'm I feel like I'm tainting these mighty things somehow by dragging them in here <laughs> But um, what happens to the people who we reward greatly, the people who risk it all, you know, who are going to put everything on the line and do what it takes? What happens to the people who just aren't very good? But The 99% of <laughs> oh. people who, who try and do it. Like the, the success stories are, are inspirational, but they're, you know, they're pretty rare. And picked. And, yeah. yeah. You know, it it turned out he, he got that way, I guess, because he... He drove around in a blood-spattered, bird-festooned f- car with his website <laughs> spelled incorrectly on it. And he just r- ran past a couple of guys who worked in film acquisitions who aren't like me and actually wanted to approach the guy. <laughs> but there must be, when you think about it, there must be untold like hordes of people like that who are more talented than James Wen, but are going to are going to fail and that's i guess that's what makes Tommy Wiseau yeah. such a, an interesting character because he seems to have fully embraced this idea of the american dream and success um despite everything being complete you know everything is a joke at his expense at this stage but he's yeah. embraced it and it seems mm. to have on the surface anyway it seems to have worked for him whereas with James Wen it's definitely a lot shakier a, a prospect yeah that's what i was yeah. going to say if he that's all he needs to do is embrace the uh, embrace the the <laughs> kitschiness, I guess, the the naffness of this yeah. series, like, and you'd be laughing. Get a film made about him, maybe. Yeah. Either that, or just be, or just be less stubborn. Like, go make yeah something else. You know, it, he keeps talking about he wants he wants to redeem himself, but he very specifically wants to do it with a Birdemic film, and he wants that movie to have a big budget, and that's just not going to happen because it's a cult movie. People yeah. aren't going to throw serious yeah. money at this thing. That being said, go make something small. You know, use some of your proceeds from the the you know Birdemic money, and make something small if uh, if you want to be a good filmmaker and surround yourself by people who actually know what they're doing. But no, he's very oof, myopic mm. in this sense. You know, he's just he knows what his he knows what he thinks is going to do it for him, and he's not going to back away from it. So to some extent, it's self-made. That's enough on James Wen. I feel like we've we've summed that up. Do we recommend Birdemic Shock and Terror to people to watch as an entertaining film? Um, with friends. Don't watch this on your own. Okay. That sounds sound. <laughs> yeah. Have an audience yeah. for this. Be yeah. You'd be laughing. I think that's it, because for me, the saving grace of the film was knowing I could message sort of Goodman and that we would have this talk about it, mm. you know, mm. so that we could take part in a discussion about how bad it is. I think with friends, yeah, you could talk through the boring bits and sort of tune back in for the fucking hilarious yeah. bits. Yeah, it's maddening almost, but it's a perfect example of how not to do a movie. And it really is. Every some mistake. of the examples are so extreme that you know I was laughing hysterically at times. I had I had my hand in my face like I had the flu or something, and I was just <laughs> being shown like flashing lights. I couldn't handle it at a lot, you know, a yeah. lot of the time. It's it's worth watching just for for that, you know. Yeah, for that reason, do try and seek this film out just to see how low, how dire a film can get. Yeah. Like, there's yeah. nothing, there's nothing to. Well, I would say to people, you know, maybe check this out, or ten minutes of it, or something, just to see mm. just how terrible a, a film can get. There's no, it. Yeah, it's it was absolute bargain basement mm. stuff. I mean, would you lose anything by <laughs> just watching the YouTube reel? I think no, you wouldn't. <sighs> just go do that. Maybe not. I think mm. if you if you can watch that mm. first diner sequence, oh, I don't know though, because there's so many of them: the diner sequence, the clapping sequence, mm. everything in fucking Tom, involving Tom, whatever his name is, uh, Woody Harrelson. <laughs> Maybe then we just need to cut out the pumpkin it's... fair and a couple of other scenes and just shave yeah, 10, 15 and minutes. And the driving, off of it. yeah, get it down to an hour, and I feel like have the birds attack at the half hour mark. I feel like you'd yeah, yeah. TV show episode made for TV movie out of this. Mm. Lifetime special. Okay, well, let's quick fire. Quick fire. Okay, so my first one is very early on, the first thing we see 
is Rod walking from his car to the diner because nothing can be left to assumptions. Yeah. <laughs> if we show Rod in his car and then show him in a diner, everyone's going to wonder how he got Did there. Did he just drive through the window? So we see him walking. <laughs> we see him walking and he just doesn't... Yeah. People don't walk like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's not a people walk. I, I made a note that there's something something of the, the uncanny valley about this, man. <laughs> just something ever so, slight, ever so slightly off with the way he moves. But the... It's like not quite human. But the best thing was that everyone else around him was walking like a normal person. You know you're a bad actor when you can't even walk. Oh. <laughs> like something you do on a daily basis and I don't you're struggling it. with. <laughs> During this walking scene, there's one point where the camera just starts behind a fucking pole. It's brilliant. <laughs> Great blocking. I've gone for something a little more, you know, I was trying to be as earnest as possible in finding finding a good thing. Sure. And mm. That final shot of them looking into the horizon, if you ignore the terrible birds, the uh, the, the rolling seas were very soothing on my uh, my hangover. Mm. I watched this with a terrible <laughs> hangover. And um, yeah, they were quite serene. After all that birds, all the birds shrieking and yelling for about an hour. Yeah. Yeah, it was a nice little uh, brief moment of respite for me. Cruel mistress. Excellent. Oh, there is a bit where the news reporter says that... Um... They have managed to contain 0% of the fire. Yeah. <laughs> the forest fire raging. <laughs> of which they have managed to contain 0%. Zero. <laughs> I like how quickly these birds can kill people. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. It, it, lit- it literally is one fell swoop. They just <laughs> like, fly past the neck and with their razor sharp yeah. talons just slit the throat. <sighs> I like yeah. that. It's like eating home. <laughs> can do that yeah in a film <laughs> maybe um i really like the line she's my ferrari i just thought that was sweet <laughs> yeah that was great Aww. um there's a scene where they're strolling together on the beach yeah and um they're talking about something and uh, but it culminates in um i think it's him it might have been her just saying um no all life i mean look at us we're made of water so what yeah uh wonderful it's that hard hitting environmental message, man. On on that note, the uh, the the old man, the the NPC that they meet on the bridge, because <laughs> um, he's wearing a he's wearing like uh, like a surgical mask, isn't he? He's covering. Yeah, yeah he's just. Covering, uh... Uh, well, I think it, the film thinks it's supposed to be a surgical mask. I think it's you actually use it for like if you're spray painting or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, he's like he's like banging on about how the birds are contaminated, and Rod and Natalie. He's like, stay away from me, stay away, the birds are contaminated, and Rod and Natalie go, we just want to talk. And then he just very, very quickly acquiesces and goes, okay. <laughs> like, it's just, like, it's just this right. bizarre yeah. world that this film exists in. Uh, Rod's friend, who's just this sex-obsessed <laughs> chump, uh, that, douche. Yeah. Um, there's yeah. this one, one bit when he's talking about, like, he's, he's trying to basically pressure him into having sex with Natalie on their first date. And he's like, I don't do that on a first date. And he's like, come on, man, a date without sex is a date wasted, man. And then he does sex motions at him. <laughs> sex motions. <laughs> With his elbows. Particularly good. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Mm, what a guy. <laughs> is, this, is, this, is this it? Am I doing it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Am I sex? <laughs> <laughs> There's a moment where they've walled themselves in to the motel and the birds are all flying around outside mm. and one bird just flies into like the door and then falls down dead. <laughs> yeah, I know it's that. <laughs> yeah. Kind of... <laughs> it happens at the end as well. Oh, one one great. bird flies into the uh the the windscreen of the car in the same same manner. Just oh, that's right. commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> when they the, the the what is it again? The merger when they all they they, they, they get a billion dollars oh, yeah. and everyone gets stock options and stuff. <laughs> The the bro guy, the sex obsessed guy, asks Rod what he's going to do. Yeah, and he says, "Oh, I'm thinking of early retirement." And then, literally, like a, a minute later, he's talking about opening his own company. Like, which one is it? Mm. Early retirement, or are you opening a company? <laughs> like, I think James Wen might have that memento condition, mm. where like he just <laughs> forgets things every only every minute. Or or maybe maybe the startup is retirement because it doesn't feel like work. Ah, maybe douchebag. Okay, shit. Film. I really love the bird getting hit animation, mm. like when they're firing at it and the bird just gets a little black blotch in its stomach. Yeah. What I particularly like about it is how every time they show it, all other sound stops dead. 
the sound of machine gun fire, which was mixed way too fucking loud, mm. incidentally. And, like, the birds scratching and squawking or people screaming, just completely silent whilst this bird gets hit and just goes, bah! The wound on the little girl when she's hiding underneath the car actually looks good. Mm. It looks <laughs> fucking rank. And um, for, the, for the few seconds that she's under the car and quite scared mm. it's decent acting yes and i felt that it's it's like the, the, the car is sort of a tinfoil hat for for shit acting it just keeps you safe <laughs> yeah i actually wrote down the little girl is good and then had to come back to that note later to correct <laughs> yep. that <laughs> yeah during the bits where um they find their friends that they went on a double date with the the effects there are quite good on the the, the slashed throat and uh, various mm. wounds yeah so. Yeah, there's some good gore, and those were actual practical effects. They went awkwardly CGI'd mm-hmm. on. Having said that, when they do get the orange juice vomited onto them, they do just have little patches of blood smeared onto yeah. them. That was crap. <laughs> um, I really liked Rod's feeble woohoo after he scores a million dollars. It's, it's just completely <laughs> disproportionate to how great it is to get a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay, I'll give you that and 50% discount. Can we close the deal today? Can I place your order today? Great, thanks. We appreciate your business. Woohoo! Hey, what's with all the noise? And when he does that, Ferrari yes. guy goes, What's all this noise? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just scored big deal. <laughs> mm. Racist. Have I talked about the, like, the pissy yellow tint? No. <laughs> Already or not? Nope. I'd have remembered a phrase like pissy yellow tint. <laughs> yeah, I just, it, I it just, it just, I just, I'm not saying it's good. I just noticed that everything looked like it was just had this weird yellow tint to it that made it look really old. Pissy. <laughs> and yeah. Also, yeah, ju- during the bit where, um, where Rod first meets Natalie and they're talking about what they do, uh, Natalie says, I'm a fat, I'm a fashion model. And Rod goes, and a beautiful one. Right. Yeah, it's gen- generally why models are employed. Yeah, that's a tautology, Rod. Mm. Um, well, seeing as no one's mentioned it, do we want to talk about the the, the amazing um, intro music? Oh God, mm. yes! It actually, you know, when I first heard it, I just thought, "Holy Christ, this is a four minute credit sequence with just over a minute's worth of music, and there is yeah. mm. the music reaches a denouement and finishes." There's a few seconds silence and then it starts yeah. up again. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> Subsequently, having watched interviews about Birdemic and seen making all features of Birdemic, Whenever that starts, it's always like, oh, yeah, I'm back. Like, it's a really good mood setter for the film because it's weird, kind yeah. of like a twisted circus, slightly disturbing, which is what I find this whole thing to be. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of well, makes sense. <laughs> you know, on a note by note basis, it's not a bad bit of music. <laughs> I mean, you know, he's, he's, going for, he's going for that Alfred Hitchcock vibe, and it really does have something of the... Bernard Herman about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just then it that, that pause before it starts again. It's just one second too long, isn't it? Yeah. It reminded for, it to, me, for it to be legit. It reminded me of the theme tune to The Elephant Man. <laughs> it has that sort of freak show vibe to it, which seems yeah. depressingly relevant here. Yeah. Oh, An- another good. Lynch reference as well. Like we're we're going high brow <laughs> with this one. <laughs> we have to. Somebody has to. We can't mm. sink to this level. Well, sp- speaking of, um, I near the end we get a few wordless scenes. I thought it was very very much like Tarkovsky. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> and it ends with Rod standing on a rock fishing, and I thought that was quite a nice shot as well. Lovely. Yeah. I didn't see that. Did I, I, I noticed that I, no, I noticed that Tippy Hedron was credited. You see that? Yep, third build, <laughs> and it's because there's a scene of a film she was in that isn't even the birds playing in the yeah. background of the motel scene. The, the, the kiss between Rod's friend and Rod's friend's girlfriend was the most convincing thing in this film. <laughs> 
Paul, was there anything from the OG team? Got a few things from the OG team. Oh, good lord. Yeah. Uh, launching the pilot actually saw this fucking film they oh. said uh, I remember the state of art special effects but also for one good thing Rod eats donuts for breakfast what a guy chocolate donuts <laughs> at that I might add Ooh. TV in space said one good thing is it exists and allows us podcasters to take the piss out of it well you've just heard this for the last hour so <laughs> what do you think Ooh. judge for yourself warranted yeah listeners at home <laughs> and finally now this was on the, the, the video negative tweet that you uh, put out mm-hmm. and I and I cannot pronounce the first name Sumus I'm going to say Seamus despite Seamus. the fact there's a U in there yeah <laughs> God. English is crazy um, Seamus Finlayson at Tartan Spartan wrote it brought joy and confusion to our lives and I'd say that's fair it's hmm. a fair summation of Bur- Birdemic joy and confusion often at once okay let's talk about the one better thing the one better thing Okay, uh, one my one better thing is a movie that was made for just a little bit more than Birdemic at fifteen thousand uh, dollars. Paranormal Activity, hmm. a movie that actually made good use of its tiny budget, um, looks cinematic. There was actually talk of remaking it for general release after it did well in the festival circuit, but they just found it was well made enough. It just needed a slightly jazzier ending, and they put it out there. And I think it's a really effective creepy atmospheric slow burning horror film uh with good performances from its largely amateur actors who were primarily um hired because they were able to use a video camera whilst walking downstairs <laughs> nevertheless they're um <laughs> given a good performance and it's creepy like um there's moments in it that really freak me out um not least the uh ending that apparently was in some way suggested by steven spielberg so Ooh. yeah it's got that going for it have an ending he said <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's how I made Jewel. <laughs> I, I was struggling with this okay. Okay. because uh, I thought, well, maybe you will, so I won't say, but I've never seen the birds, mm. so mm. that would seem like the obvious obvious thing. Sure, yeah. Um, and then I put, is it okay if I abstain? <laughs> <laughs> but then you mentioned um, the Robert Rodriguez film. El Mariachi. El Mariachi, yeah. Uh I'd suggest that if you yeah. want to see a film that was actually made for less than this, mm. that has some, you know, considerably more panache and is actually enjoyable and also uses non-professional actors, I'd say that. Check out El Mariachi. Definitely. Completely different film, but, you know, low budget film done right. Absolutely. It's not amazing, but it's worth checking out. Okay, so the options are either a sincere low-budget movie or overblown environmental disaster movie, and I just bloody went and thought, why not recommend a sincere, low-budget kind of environmental disaster sci-fi, in a sense? The happening. Of course, I'm talking about Gareth Edwards' 2010 Monsters. Yay! Yeah, uh, taking place years after a NASA probe crash in Mexico led to the sudden appearance of monsters. Scoot, Scoot McNary <laughs> escorts his employer's daughter back to the US by passing through Mexico's infected zone where all the beasties live. Scoot McNary is great in his own way, as he always is, and more than anything else, it's very inventive with its visual effects, and it manages to do some really impressive things with a $500,000 budget. So it's a lot higher than the films that we've been discussing, but you did have to pay Scoot McNary. <laughs> so uh, it's well worth a watch, I think. Nice. Yeah, cool. I completely fucking forgot that that was Scoot McNary in that film. I think I watched it yeah. long before Anyone knew what he was, who he was, how he yeah. was, when he was. Is that a name? Oh. Who knows? <laughs> the one better thing. Great. All right. Well, Oliver, can you tell us where people can find out about Video Negative? Absolutely. Uh, we're on SoundCloud. We're on Stitcher. We're on iTunes. Uh, we're probably on a bunch of other places, which I don't really understand how they've got on there. But <laughs> if someone if someone's done that themselves, then thank you very much. Um, we have a YouTube page with some little bonus clips. Um, so if you in, are interested in checking out the show, but can't be bothered listening to an entire episode, um, <laughs> I'd head to the YouTube page, check those out. And if you do like what you hear, then uh, leave a little rating wherever you listen to on iTunes, wherever you listen to. That'd be great. <laughs> and also we're on Twitter and Facebook video negative. It's fine. Just search that. Lovely. Good stuff, and uh, purely perfunctorily, uh, Paul, hypothetically, if someone was interested in one good thing, what could they do about that? Aside from seek professional help. Yeah, imagining that somebody would be, you uh, you don't have the option of checking out handy bite-sized snippets of us, uh, it's the f- full fat or fuck off, <laughs> if, uh, is the one good thing motto. 
Um, but yeah, um, <laughs> catch us in the usual places. Check check out Twitter and Facebook for updates and to send us your one good things. Send us an email at ogtpod at gmail dot com. Uh, if you haven't subscribed already, then you should. You can do so on iTunes, YouTube. I recently did an SEO on it, so it's easier to find now. Uh, all good podcatchers still. Uh, every subscription nudges us that little bit closer to podcast heaven. So anything you can do is greatly appreciated. And thanks, Ollie, for coming on. It's been fun. Mm, no problem. Thanks for having me. No worries. And thanks for the recommendation. <laughs> yeah. Suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> Ollie... <laughs> Holly Irwin's great suggestion <laughs> and favorite film. Holly Irwin's Birdemic. But can I just quickly say, like, I, I chose this because I, I wanted to ruin your show. <laughs> I wanted to try and break it. Get rid of the competition. Well, I think at this point we're both we're both made of sterner stuff. Like, yeah, <laughs> I've seen worse films than this. Oh, yeah. I've seen worse films than this. I, I don't know. I don't know what film is finally going to break us, but it's not Birdemic. Did you did you recommend Birdemic and then um or suggest Birdemic? Sorry, and then realise that you had to do it yourself as well. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. All yeah. this week I was like, oh god, I've got to watch. Damn. Birdemic. Foiled. <laughs> Shock and terror. Mm-hmm. Cut off my film nose to spite my face. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm Paul Salt. I'm Paul Goodman. I'm Oliver Irwin. And remember, the one good thing about Birdemic, Shock and Terror is that I'm pretty sure he does pronounce it Gwen. Gwen.